Chapter 19, Section 2, Emerging Economic Tensions. After coming to the United States, Nicola Saccio and Bartolomo Vensetti struggled to make a living. Saccio worked for a construction company as a water boy and a pick a shoveler. He made as little as $1.15 a day for backbreaking labor. After 12 hour shifts, he spent three nights a week studying English. Eventually, he found a job as a shoemaker, which paid better. At the Milford Shoe Company, he earned between $30 to $40 a week. Vansetti had a harder life than Sacho. Over the years, he worked as a dishwasher, a bricklayer, a cook, and a factory hand in an iron mill. At the time of his arrest, he was selling fish from a cart that he pushed through the streets. None of his jobs ever paid enough to buy a home, wear nice clothes, or marry. Still, Sacho and Vansetti did have jobs. In the years just after World War I, many other American workers did not. Demobilization causes massive unemployment. World War I had created great economic prosperity in the United States. The federal government had signed billions of dollars worth of contracts for war-related materials. It had also centralized the management of transportation, manufacturing, and agriculture under the War Industries Board. The results of this government planning were impressive. During the war years, steel production had doubled and agricultural exports tripled. Nonetheless, the government was ill-prepared for conversion to a post-war economy. When the fighting ended sooner than expected, the federal government had no plans for demobilization, the transition from wartime to peacetime. The day after the armistice was signed, telephone lines in Washington, D.C. were so clogged by government officials canceling contracts that ordinary citizens had trouble making long-distance calls. This sudden cancellation of government contracts made wide ripples in the economy. Hundreds of factories that had produced war materials closed. Crop prices fell as overseas demand for farm products dropped. Millions of Americans were suddenly thrown out of work. The employment situation grew even worse when the Army discharged nearly 4 million soldiers, giving each of them just $60 and a one-way ticket home. By 1920, more than 5 million Americans were jobless. Economic upheavals result in inflation and recession. By the end of 1920, the economy reflected the long-term effects of demobilization. Immediately after the war, Americans had gone on a spending spree, buying goods with money they had saved during the war. The result was a spike in inflation. As prices went up, the value of a dollar shrank by more than 15% a year. Average Americans in 1920 paid twice as much for clothing as for food such as bread, butter, and bacon as they had in 1913. All but the richest Americans saw their standard of living drop as prices rose. The combination of high inflation and rising unemployment led to a sharp recession, a decline in economic activity and prosperity. Between 1920 and 1921, some 100,000 businesses went bankrupt. In those same years, 453,000 farmers lost their land. People got by as best they could, in some cases turning to crime to survive. The robbery murder involving Sacho and Vanzetti was just one of the many violent incidents in a growing crime wave. The robbery took place on April 15, 1920 in South Braintree, Massachusetts. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, two payroll masters for the Slater and Morrill Shoe Factory were carrying lockboxes containing $16,000 from the payroll office to the factory. On the way, they were stopped by two armed bandits. Despite the fact that the two payroll masters dropped their boxes without a struggle, they were shot and left to bleed to death on the street. One of the gunmen fired a shot into the air, signaling their getaway car. From start to finish, the robbery took less than a minute. The South Braintree crime was similar to another robbery four months earlier in nearby Bridgewater, Massachusetts. As historian Frederick Lewis Allen later noted, crimes like this had become so commonplace they received little newspaper coverage. There had taken place at South Braintree, Massachusetts, a crime so unimportant that it was not even mentioned in the New York Times of the following day or for that matter, of the whole following year. It was a sort of crime which was taking place constantly all over the country. Frederick Lewis Allen, only yesterday, 1931.